big up some people that made this possible. First, the Galoi team, I see some of them in the back there, um, that for making an open source wallet stack that I could build on top of. Also the Ibex team for creating a custodial lightning solution that, had, that has API access. For the Breeze team, for creating a non-custodial lightning solution that has API access. And then um, I'm gonna give a special big up to Bob from Prisms, because he showed me what's possible when you supercharge lightning with Noster, which you'll see here as well. And then lastly, big up everybody here, because you guys are the ones building this from the ground up. So I wanna make sure that you know we're building a firm foundation and it's because of people in this room and people at this conference that that's possible. So thank you. All right, who is Dread? I'm a freedom tech advocate. What does that mean? That means any tech that is free, but not as in free beer, as in freedom and liberty. I'm an advocate of building that. Um, I'm with OpenSats that we help to fund projects like that, as long as they're open source and driving towards freedom. I am also have been called from certain rando politicians a shadowy super coder. Uh, not really super, but I consider myself a developer by this point. And then lastly, I'm the host of the One Love Bitcoin podcast. So if you've seen my podcast, I try to interview one Bitcoiner or person from every part of the world, one country, and find out what their view is on Bitcoin and what their view is on Bitcoin in their country. And I usually learn a thing or two along the way. So it's a really good thing, way to you know, find out about different places and, and really expand uh, your mind in terms of how, what people are, are dealing with around different countries around the world. So if, check out my podcast if you want to know about any countries or if you have any country that you want to hear from, send me a message and I'll find somebody to interview from that country. I think I'm up to 30 something countries now and I plan to do them all. So it's going to be a long road, but I'll get there. All right. So what is the Caribbean? Besides it being me, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the Caribbean happens to be a massive archipelago, uh, which is a string of islands that actually separates us right here on the string of um, Central South America from the North Atlantic Sea, North Atlantic Ocean. These islands have had a long history of, you know, war, discovery, colonization, you know, more war, more colonization. That's happened for a long time. And these islands go from Bermuda, Bahamas, all the way down through to Trinidad and Tobago. And we even consider the neighboring coastal countries like Belize and Guyana a part of the Caribbean too because they share our Caribbean culture, they share our Caribbean sea, they share our trade routes. So it's very, you know, it's really, they, officially they might tell you it's 13 nations, 13 islands that the Caribbean consists of. It's more like 26 or 30 different countries that the Caribbean consists of. And that spans across six different languages officially, more than 20 different dialects, creoles, uh, patois as we call it in Jamaica. And they're all different but very similar cultures. We have very, thing, very similar things we like together and then there are certain things that we completely differ on. But it's all love. You know, there's no rivalry per se across the island nations. Um, unfortunately, there's more than just water that separates us. You know, we're separated by a lot of different invisible jurisdictional lines that keep capital controls, keep it hard to travel, keep it hard to even communicate. Like uh, a, a call you'd think should be easy to make from, Carib from Jamaica to Haiti or Jamaica to Cuba. And it's much easier for me to call Florida. It's much easier for me to fly to Florida than it is to fly 90 miles east to Cuba or 90 miles west to Haiti. So you can imagine what trade is like. It's, you know, smuggling is easier than making actual trade with some islands between each other compared to going to first world countries. So there's a lot of invisible lines that keep us separated in the Caribbean that keep us from being able to talk to each other and trade with each other and show each other love. But that doesn't stop us, I'll tell you that much, because every year, multiple times a year, we have casted some people nodding, we have carnival. If you know about the Caribbean, and pretty much most of Latin America too, you know about carnival. Carnival is where all of our cultures come together and we share our culture, we share our fun, we, we release our stress after the crop is over, you know, we, we enjoy each other's love until the next time. And it's not just one carnival, even though some bigger ones like Jamaica and Trinidad bring islands from all over the place, but there's smaller ones too. 
that people go to. There's also satellite carnivals that happen in the U.S. and Canada and Europe and everywhere. And there's also, you know, some of the bigger original carnivals in Brazil, Spain. So this is a very strong cultural reference that we have that brings the Caribbean together. And that can really tell you how many nations are a part of the Caribbean. Because you're not going to see 13. You're not going to see 26. You're going to see, I don't know, north of 50 different countries that are represented in Carnival when they're waving their flags and drinking their drinks in front of those trucks, marching down the street. So I would advise you guys to at least enjoy one Carnival if you're in the region and see what it's like. I think you saw the costumes similar to what we saw um, the beautiful Alejandra Miss Bitcoin wear. It's a very similar type of costume that we wear um, when we're doing road march uh, at our carnivals. So I'm a very big fan of it. I've been there many times. And um, I want you guys to know about that. That's, that's what I would consider to be one of the big prides of the Caribbean. But we're not here to talk about carnival, right? We're here to talk about money so and how to fix it. So let me stay on topic. <laughs> What do we think in the Caribbean? What does a diaspora think about money? There's, I mean, we have a very similar view on money and the problems that it has as m many other developing nations, but there's some specific things I wanted to touch on. One, cash is king. As you saw in the previous presentation, a lot of people are underbanked. In Jamaica, it happens to be just shy of 50%. And that's a rising number. Before it was much higher, but they're starting to push for bank accounts in Jamaica now. So it's still about 50% of people that are either underbanked or unbanked completely. Underbanked means they might have a bank account, but can't get a credit card, can't get a loan, can't get any, you know, any other financial services. Or unbanked means they can't even get a bank account, whether it's lack of documentation or just lack of qualification. Also, it's painful to use. If you have a bank account in Jamaica, do you really want to use it? A lot of people I talked to yesterday were very surprised when I told them it cost a fee to deposit your money in the bank in Jamaica. It cost a fee to do everything in the bank in Jamaica. And if you're making a minimum um, wage in Jamaica, which is equivalent to about $300 per month, you don't want to pay $3 and $4 to deposit your money in the bank just to pay another $3 to pull it out, to pay another $3 to pay somebody. That doesn't make any sense if you're making $300 for the month. So a lot of people that have bank accounts, they might not be using them because it doesn't make financial sense practically for them to use them. Credit cards, forget about it. We're talking about 40% or more monthly interest rates because we have a different set of rates and a different set of credit scores that we use. So. A lot of people can't even qualify, and if they do, they can't afford a credit card, the average minimum wage worker or low-income worker. Also, in the banks in Jamaica, and this is across many islands too, it varies. Some islands actually have international cards, but some don't. But in Jamaica, they do not have international debit cards. Some banks might work in some websites, you might get lucky, but the average Jamaican debit card with the Visa logo, you can't use that on Amazon. You can't use that on Netflix. You, know, you, can't, you can't buy anything from a foreign country that easily. Maybe if you had one of the credit cards, but that's a 40% interest rate. But you can't use your average debit card with your money in the bank to buy anything from abroad, unfortunately, unless you, you know, do it some roundabout way, pay somebody in the US to have it shipped down for you and have a friend of a friend, links, as we call it. So that's pretty hard. So that, because of that, cash is king. A lot of people in Jamaica use cash because even if you are one of the lucky people in Jamaica to have a white collar job, you know, have a decent income, use your bank account, use your credit card, to, debit card to buy stuff, many shops that you go to, they're not gonna have banks. So they're not gonna accept your debit card. So they want cash from you. So what are you gonna do with your bank account? You're gonna go to the ATM and pull out the cash so you can use it. So even if you have the bank account, you still need the cash because the economy is still cash dominant. So because of that, every two weeks or I think it's bi-monthly in Jamaica is average, on payday, you see a line around the block for the ATMs because people with bank accounts are going to get their money out of the ATM as soon as they get paid so they can have money in their pocket to pay for different things, whether it's pay their bills, buy their food, you know, pay for whatever they're going to pay, go out and have a drink. Most bars in different 
towns, you have to pay cash. So it's a regular thing to have cash in your pocket, right? And you don't also don't want to be paying buying transfers every time you want to buy something when you can just do one big um, ATM fee to get out the cash in your, in your pocket. And then every payment you make now is free because it's cash handing over, right? There's no fee to hand somebody cash. That's a big benefit. People you know, under, uh, underestimate it. Um, so there's a circular economy happening there already with cash. Not fully circular, but from the person gets paid and they pull out their cash, they're going to the, to the shop owner and, and, sell, and giving them the cash for the food. The shop owner now is paying their employees with cash. The shop owner now is also giving their supplier cash to re-up their stock. And it's only when the supplier goes back into town to go to the major wholesale to, to resupply himself is when that cash ends up back in a bank account. So it hit almost a full circle there of just cash. Okay? And I'm not even going to talk about the money transfer stuff yet because that's like the major use case in terms of, you know, why we need this, a solution for this that's not cash. Because you're talking about people having loads of cash in their pocket, being dangerous, trying to... You saw it in the previous presentation too. A lot of the points he hit on are very relevant for the Caribbean. You have to travel to go to a, a money transfer place. You have to get the cash out in front of people. It's not, a, it's not a private booth you can go to. It's a long line of people watching you get your cash. You're walking out of the store with all this cash in your pocket to go back on a bus to go home with cash in your pocket. It's dangerous. But this is the, still the most reliable and the safest way to do it compared to banks. And why is that? Well, this is another thing Jamaicans think about money in, um, <clears throat> in the system. They have deep distrust of the banking system, very deep distrust. And it's rightfully so. Not only do the banks charge you all these fees, deposit, withdraw, transfer, just hold it fee. Also, if you're one of the minorities in Jamaica that can have savings in your bank account, you are regularly putting your funds at risk. Because one, you're putting at risk from the devaluation. Jamaica got independence in 1962. We had a short period of time where we were like equal to the dollar. US dollar one, Jamaican dollar one. Strong dollar, strong currency, right? Not really. From 1969 to 1985, 16 years later, a 70% loss in the value of the dollar. It went from one to 120 to $5.50 for one US dollar. So if you were saving that time, if you were working for 16 years and saving your money, you lost 70% of your value by the end of those 16 years. But wait, there's more. 18 years after that, if you were in that class, that generation of people saving, it went from $5.50 to $57 to one US dollar. That's a 90% loss in your value in 18 years. Again, saving for a house, forget about it. You can't even pay the down payment now. But wait, there's more. 20 years later to today, right now, that $57 is now $154, $155 for one US dollar, which is on a 60% loss, which if you ask the traditional ec economists in Jamaica, they'd say, well, that's a win. We're doing better. We improve, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's pretty bad. You don't want to save your money in just the currency. You want to make it work for you. That's what they tell you, right? The typical Keynesian economist is going to say, well, who just leaves their money in the bank? That's not a smart idea. Make it work for you. Put it in an investment fund. Put it in SSL, one of the most well-known, you know, renowned, multi-generational financial firms in Jamaica that can make you some money. <laughs> He's like, don't do it, don't do it. Why, is it, why don't do it, Ajay? Massive corruption. What happened with, with, with SSL? Usain Bolt, one of our favorite, revered, legendary people of all Jamaica loves, had his local retirement and was robbed of 2.1 million US dollars. Oh my God. In the bank, in the bank, m making it work for him an investment. <laughs> and how did this happen? Did they hack the bank? Did they go in with a gun and rob them at gunpoint? No, the thief was the bank. This was an inside job. I can, it might be systemic, I don't know. This is a still an open law case. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you what really happened. But he hasn't gotten his money back yet. And it's not just him. 
This revealed dozens and dozens of people that had money siphoned from their bank accounts, from their investment accounts in this bank alone. And don't feel like this bank is an isolated incident. So the banks, I don't know if I'd call them safe, and the average Jamaican does not think so. What else do we think about money? Well, even though we don't trust the banks and we love cash, tech is hard. You know, <laughs> like a fintech app in Jamaica, very hard adoption strategy. You know, like many people have tried it before. Many apps have come. And because there's not really an API banking culture in Jamaica or the Caribbean, it's not that easy to have a fintech app like Cash App or Venmo or PayPal where you can just send somebody some money. It doesn't exist. The banking system just doesn't allow it or doesn't support it, I should say. It does allow it, it doesn't support it. And then trying to build it on your own is pretty cumbersome. And then trying to follow the regulations that, that, make, that you need, it creates a lot of you know, excessive KYC and a lot of friction to sign up. So there's no user adoption. They had a um, CBDC that they rolled out last year called Jamdex. And they created a wallet called the Link Wallet from NCB. And that wallet actually worked pretty well, to be honest. You could get your CBDC, you could go to the ATM, scan a QR code, get the money out. Less than 2% adoption after spending billions of Jamaican dollars in marketing. Why is that? Jamaicans don't trust the banks, and the banks are the ones giving them this fintech app. And then the fintech app is very hard to use in terms of KYC. So it's a hard problem, you know? Like tech is hard, but that doesn't mean that Jamaicans hate all tech, you know? As long as the tech is easy, it can work. They love mobile phones. We have over 100% immersion adoption in mobile phones. Some Jamaicans have two mobile phones, one Digicel, one Flow. You know, like, we love phones, and we love apps. Everybody have WhatsApp, Instagram, scrolling, TikTok. You know, I don't use TikTok. So we love all the cool stuff, you know? So tech can go viral very easily if it's easy to use and frictionless. So we need it to be easy. So what now? Why am I rambling on about all this stuff in Jamaica? What am I planning to do for Jamaica, right? How, what can we provide for them in Jamaica and the Caribbean to fill this gap that they have? Welcome to Flash. The first mobile wallet to actually hold lightning from the gods itself. No, I'm just kidding. That's Zeus. You saw that yesterday. Uh, no, but this is the first mobile app that's focused on connecting the Caribbean. And you might say to yourself, oh, Lord, YAML, yet another mm, lightning wallet. Everybody building lightning wallets now, right? Well, yes, but as Steve Jobs would say, this changes everything. Not everything, but it changes some things, especially Jamaican access, Caribbean access, and access to places that don't have the banking rails that places like the Americas, the first world countries in, the Euro in Europe are used to. So, how does that work? Well, remittance is the main use case. In remittance, people are sending money to Jamaica, and like I said, if they're not sending it to a bank account, they want that cash in hand. And in Jamaica alone, the annual remittance is $3.4 billion per year. Incoming alone. Across the Caribbean, across all the nations I just said, is over $25 billion incoming from places like the US, Canada, England, Cayman Islands, Turks and Caicos, all coming to different Caribbean islands, and actually some of the um, coastal re um, countries like as well, like Guyana, Belize. A lot of money is coming through there, and Western Union, MoneyGram, and these giants are taking their fair share, anywhere between 2% for a bank account transfer to 8 to 9% if you are doing the average amount of transfer which is about 200 to $250. It's a very insipid system, where if you're sending less than $100, they give you a nice promotional rate, 1%, 2%, come on in. If you're sending the average amount of money you want to send home to your family to buy some food or pay them rent or whatever the case is, they're gonna charge you up to 6 7% for between two and $500. And once you're over $500, they lower the rate again. What are they doing? They're capturing the market and putting the highest rate where the highest demand is. So it's a really rough system for people who don't really have, can't really afford to send more money. And like most countries, like here, actually in El Salvador, our GDP 
is a good percentage of our remittance, is a good percentage of our GDP. It's over 20% in Jamaica. <clears throat> so remittance is an important thing for us to solve. And it's a, it's a good use case for a Lightning wallet in Jamaica as long as it has an off-ramp. So grassroots off-ramps is what I'm building. This is the real business for Flash. Right, we're a Lightning wallet, and I'll get into the technicals of the Lightning wallet in a second, but this is the reason why Flash is going to work. Because we're going business to business, starting with the remittance companies in Jamaica that already have their licensing, already have their, their um, you know, whatever regulations they need in their jurisdiction to be able to send and receive money. And we're going to be another option for people to go in with a Bitcoin wallet and walk out with cash. With less friction, less KYC, less everything else, less fees. So most people are going to say, all right, yeah, great, remittance, so what? <laughs> people are still going to do what they do, right? It's really hard to get people to change from what they used to do to what they should be doing if it's better for them. The average person is not going to change their habits, even if something is improved, unless that thing is 10 times better than the previous product or the incumbent. Right? This is from a lot of studies and different um, you know, historical marketing changes. So what can make a Bitcoin wallet and a Lightning solution 10 times better than the average cash flowing around the world? Well, let's look at cash first. Cash money, what's good about it? Well, it's private. It's in your pocket and nobody don't know you have it unless they see the bulge. Now, I'm not talking about banks here or bank accounts. I'm talking about cash in your hand, right? Also, it's no fees. Right? You give somebody some money or you get some money, there's no fee in there. There's nobody taking out a percentage of that from you. It's non-custodial. It's in your pocket, so it's in your pocket. Nobody can't take it from you unless they came to knock down your door with a wrench or a gun. And it's easy to use. Everybody knows how to use cash. You grew up using cash. Nobody has to explain to you how to use cash with a document or a manual. But the downside, it's dangerous, like I said. It's dangerous to walk around with cash in many different places. It's, there's no backup or insurance. You lose your cash, it's gone. Nobody's going to insure your cash for you if it's in your pocket. And there's no hard drive backup of the cash anywhere. And it's in-person only. These are important points now. It's in-person only. So if you, um, like the previous presentation said, if you're paying a bill, you have to go and pay that bill with the cash. If you're paying seven bills, you have to go seven different places and pay those bills with your cash. That's a whole day for some people. Wasted, just walking around paying bills. And also, one-to-one -one payments. And this goes for bank accounts too, and debit cards and credit cards, but it's something that people don't realize it's a limitation on the way we use money today. Right now, if you're gonna pay somebody something, you can only pay one person at a time, right? I pay you, then I pay you, and then I pay you. There's no way to really like pay four people in one click or one, one go, unless they're all in front of you, or I don't, I don't think it's even possible. You'd have to really just pay them one at a time. So what is our adoption strategy? It is to use that and make Flash 10 times better than what cash can do. And that will hopefully get people's attention to start using a better solution. And how would we do that? Well, we use the full stack, what I like to call it. Bitcoin, unstoppable, uncensorable, immutable money, lightning, instant payments, both custodial and non-custodial, and then Noster, what I consider layer three, a communication layer that allows you to supercharge lightning and give it additional capabilities. How many time I have? Five minutes? I'm done? I did start late. <laughs> All right, give me, give me five more minutes. All right, I'll, I'll go fast. And, and this is how it's going to work with the full stack, right? <clears throat> did I go forward? Yeah. It's also private. It's no fees. We're going to make sure that the Lightning payments are always zero fees unless you're doing on-chain or converting. It's non-custodial. It's easy to use. Safe. You don't have to worry about people robbing you if you have it on your phone. It's backup, so we're going to have the actual non-custodial keys on your phone. And then custodial will be with the keys will be with the custodian. Global now, this is important because a lot of people in Jamaica don't have the ability to buy things. 
And now with BitRefill, with the Bitcoin company, you can use Bitcoin to buy things abroad. So that's important. And then one-to-many payments. And this, I think, gives it the 10x launch that it wants. Because one-to-many payments are big. There's many different things you can do with one-to-many payments. What Nostra Wallet Connects allows you to use a one-click and something like Prisms to pay five of your friends if you wanted to for whatever you're doing with them. A friends group, a fan club, a community savings plan, mutual aid, which I heard about in Japan and I love that idea, or e even easy bill pay. You can pay all your bills with just one click if you have it all set up in a Prism style um, account. So this is something that doesn't exist in the current financial system today that we can do on Lightning with Nostar. And then two, split payments. You receive payments as a business. Do you have to go and pay your employees one by one? No. In the future, you could do something like a split payment where if a service is paid for, you automatically pay everybody the percentage they're supposed to get. This can change the entire model of how businesses run and make it a lot easier for people to be able to pay their employees, keep their time to themselves, and you know, a lot of productivity can be saved. And this is just one idea, right? There's, who knows what other future unknown unknowns can be built from the brilliant minds in the Caribbean based on this kind of new, you know, supercharged um, lightning payment abilities that we have. So, running through the last two slides, I promise last two. <laughs> Flash, I won't give a demo since don't have time, but this is what it looks like. It probably looks very familiar to you because it's on top of the Bitcoin Beach wallet, now called Blink. If you look, the top says Cash US, the bottom says Bitcoin. The top is non-custodial. No, the top is custodial, and it's a big uh, US denominated. The bottom is non-custodial. Top custodial, bottom non-custodial. Top custodial, bottom non. It's one click to change between one and the other. It's super cool, and it's one click to change between US denominated and Bitcoin denominated, just like the Blink wallet. So, that's going to be huge for Jamaicans who want to know what Bitcoin feels like but still be able to go back to a US safe dollar if they need to pay bills. And then we have a Nostra tab, where if you have businesses or have people you wanna to talk to, you can go in there and do DMs with them using Nostra and go public chat in different businesses using Nostra. This opens up communities across the islands, across businesses, and allows people to chat to each other and do business with each other without needing any banking infrastructure whatsoever. And then of course, we use the rest of the Galloway stack to do education, you know, um, island specific context we're gonna be putting into the quizzes that are there. So we can actually teach people about their own islands and about Bitcoin at the same time while they're earning stats. So to wrap it up, my company is built for freedom. These are my three main mission points. We free the money. What does that mean? We're giving people non-custodial solutions and custodial solutions so they can do both lightning and on-chain, lightning for free. We free the market. We're going to make sure we have free and open listings of businesses across the Caribbean so that people can have censorship-resistant communication with their businesses and their people. And then we free the code. Everything we're building here is open source. We're building on top of open source. We have a plugin that's going to be API agnostic in the future. People can use to plug into Blink with any other API service that's out there as we build on it. And that's going to be very, very cool. And then lastly, Anybody who wants to help us to build, please reach out to me, shout me. I'm looking for developers, I'm looking for marketing people, I'm looking for anybody in the Caribbean that has links, that wants to help me build this mission. Come shout me. <laughs> Connecting the Caribbean people. Thank you.